All right, so let's get uh, started on today's class. So um, what we're going to do today is we're going to uh, start working on some of our projects. Uh, we're going to take a look at uh, how to use the background research that you have been collecting. So uh, we're going to be building our project on the shoulders of things that have come before. So how do we use that information uh, to develop a hypothesis, to model some research, uh, to start doing our uh, studies. But before we get to that, I just uh, wanted to uh, mention two things. Number one, it was brought to my attention that uh, the uh, files tab had not been automatically published in Canvas, which means that the uh, lecture slides that I have been posted were not accessible for any of my students. This is a new feature that they've sprung on us this semester, so I apologize for that. I fixed it. So you can now go in, you can download these lecture slides that are going to be available for you um, So from now to the future. Uh, and if I ever talk about something and you go into Canvas and it's not available for you there, if I say, oh yeah, I uploaded it to Canvas and it's not there, please let me know. I've lost confidence in uh, Canvas's intuitive publishing abilities. So if I say something like, oh, and you can find this slide, uh, email me if you can. All right, so first thing we're going to do, uh, this is, uh, as I mentioned last time, there's a bonus opportunity uh, for your grade in this class uh, for social media professional development. This is going to be the first assignment. Uh, all of these assignments are going to be rather short, quick little things that you can do. And once again, what we're looking to do is to uh, give you a professional presence in this, uh, in a research community that you uh, are going to be uh, transforming uh, into. So uh, assignment number one, a few steps for this one. First thing you want to do is you want to set up a, uh, a professional Twitter account. So uh, if you don't have a Twitter account, uh, then you can follow this link and it'll let you know for how to sign up for one. Uh, if you already have a Twitter account, you can follow this link and it'll let you know how to set up multiple Twitter accounts. So Twitter is what we're going to be using uh, for the professional uh, development. And um, the first thing, uh, what I mean by a professional Twitter account is that I mean in an account that is dedicated towards your career goals. That is an account that in this case is dedicated towards psychology. So um, I have uh, two separate Twitter accounts. One is for psychology. That's where I post my work. That's where I post my students' research. That's where I post you know, different educational things, links to articles that I find interesting. And then I have a personal account, and that's where I post how my daughter did on her most recent swim meet. Right. So what you're going to find is that as you continue to build your, your presence in the, in the research community, people will start following you and uh, they follow you because they want a sort of consistent stream of uh, contributions of content from you. So um, people that are interested in my psychology, they follow my psychology Twitter account. People that are interested in my family, they follow my personal Twitter account. Nobody follows both because if I'm posting things about metaphorical pictures, that person is not going to be interested in scrolling through five or six posts about how my daughter did on the last swim meet. So you, you need a professional account, something that is dedicated to your uh, profession. If you don't already have a Twitter account, sign up for one. Uh, use a name that you uh, is a professional name. Uh, so use your own name. If that's taken, they'll have some suggestions. Um, there's also tips you can find online how to get a uh, Twitter account. Mine is Polite Insane because that's the name of my research lab. Um, and then uh, if you don't have an account, sign up for one. If you do and you've ever posted anything that is not psychology related, I would suggest start a new account. So if you have posts about your you know, trip to the Bahamas and your outfit of the day and how much you liked, uh, you know, how much you liked the new... Um, you know, M. Night Shyamalan movie, that's fine. That's awesome. Keep it. But let's set up one that is a professional account going from here on forward. So there is a way to manage multiple accounts. Uh, you can have one for your work and one for uh, your personal life. All right, so that's step one. Step two, via Canvas messages, uh, send me your username. So when you finally do sign up, because I'm going to be keeping track of participation, uh, via Twitter, um, for some of you it will be obvious, for others, uh, others it might not be, 
So send me your Twitter name so I know who's uh, been doing what. Send me that through uh, Canvas messages. Uh, step three, follow me on Twitter. So find my account. It's at Palad Insane uh, on Twitter. And just hit that follow button to follow me on Twitter. And uh, that'll be the beginning of your professional network. And then the last thing is to find one more IUSB psychology professor that you would like to find on Twitter. So I know at the very least three of us exist. Uh, there might be more. So there's two ways to find this. Number one, enter their name into uh, Google. If you follow that up with Twitter, it will find their accounts uh, on Twitter. Um, some of those are incredibly easy. So for example, uh, my name doesn't really pop up much anywhere else. Dr. Rodriguez, I was able to find his very quickly on, um, uh, on, on Google. Uh, other ones are more difficult. So uh, Dr. Bryant, her name is Dave Bryant. Apparently there's a football player called Des Bryant. And the first 20 pages of Google are all about him and not about her. And it's very difficult to find if she has a Twitter account. Um, another example, Dr. Ladd. As you might imagine, there's more than a couple Kevin Lads out there, you know, in the uh, in the world. So uh, the other way to do it outside of Google is to just, you know, send them a quick email and say, do you have a Twitter account? Uh, if so, what's your username? And use that. But try to find a, uh, one more IUSB psychology professor on Twitter and follow them uh, as well. So this will be the first in the uh, professional development Assignments shouldn't take very long to do this at all. And uh, we're going to have this due Monday, January 14th uh, by midnight. So if you want to earn that 10% towards your final grade, this is step number one. Uh, and again, these files are available in Canvas. You have access to them now. I made sure of it. Uh, but in case you don't, just let me know. All right. So that's the social media development. Let's get down to the actual uh, advanced lab portion of today's class. All right, so again, we're gonna be using our background research. We're gonna be using it to develop hypotheses. We're gonna be using it to model research. Uh, we're gonna be using it as a starting point for the projects that we're doing. So we're gonna take a look at how to apply theories. Uh, using that background research, uh, how do we use prior theories? Uh, how do we use those to develop hypotheses of what we expect is going to occur? Um, what uh, techniques can we use, such as making simplifications that allows us to apply theories uh, in order to make those new applications? And then finally, we're going to take a look at modeling research, uh, how you can use ideas from other people to actually do the things that you want to do. So in terms of our uh, progression through this course, uh, today we're going to be taking a look at some of the skills that we need for the topic paragraph and research hypothesis and for the introduction uh, draft. Oh, and uh, be sure to be doing your plagiarism certificate test. If you've already done that, just track down your certificate and upload that in the assignments and the ProProps APA test. I believe that's due. Uh, yep. I got mine, but I was having a hard time converting it to PDF. So could we like screenshot and send it to you, or would you rather try to figure out how to convert it? I think it, it comes in a PDF, doesn't it? No? Does it? Yeah. I sent mine in and it was an email. Yeah. So what you do is oh. you go to print it. Oh. And then under the printer options, it, there should be a convert to PDF. Got it. Okay. okay. Yeah. So print it and convert it to PDF. Uh, and we'll upload those. All right. So yeah, so this is what we're working on today. All right. So the background research. So you're going to be using uh, prior theories. This is very, very important. It is very difficult to make a contribution uh, to psychology without knowing or basing it on anything that came before. So as Isaac Newton says, you see further by standing on the shoulders of giants. Same thing with psychology. If you want to make a quality contribution, if you want to maximize your chances that your research is going to lead to something, it's got to be built on stuff that has come before. So we're going to start with the uh, prior theories. And uh, the prior theories, um, they will be incorporated into your own research. They will be incorporated into your presentations. They will form the basis, the starting point for your entire project. So one of the first things we're going to do with these prior theories 
is we're going to use them to start planning out our research. We're going to use them to start developing some of our hypotheses. So the way that you use prior research and prior theories is by using them to make deductions. So we're going to use our logical skills, we're going to use our deductive reasoning, and we are going to apply theories to the questions that we want to answer. We're going to apply theories to make predictions for the questions that we want to answer. And one of the challenges in that is that most theories, or many theories, might not be directly applicable to your particular situation. And that is what happens when you're making a novel contribution to psychology. There's not going to be a theory that covers your novel contribution directly. If there was, it wouldn't be a novel contribution. Right? We would already know what was going to happen. So the theories might not be directly applicable. So what we need to do is we need to use techniques that allow us to apply them. And one of the techniques that will help is to make simplifications that allow you to take your theory that doesn't directly apply, but make it apply in order so that you can have these new applications, these new ways of using this theory, this novel contribution to psychology. So I'll give you an example of how this occurs. So uh, when I was uh, doing my graduate work, uh, one of the projects that I was involved in was a study of uh, drawing and the blind. So this is my supervisor here, Dr. Kennedy, and this is actually a very famous blind um, artist named Eshref Armigan. And uh, here we have, you know, we can see our little setup here, and we would give Eshref uh, different uh, challenges. We would give him different little models to hold, cups to hold, you know, different arrangements. And then we would simply ask him, can you draw these? And he would use a raised line drawing kit, which is a rubberized surface, uh, that you put a sheet of paper on and uh, plastic, it's a sheet of plastic, not paper. But when you draw with a ballpoint pen, it actually raises the surface of that uh, plastic so you can feel where your line is. So uh, drawing in the blind, completely novel contribution. Dr. Kennedy was one of the pioneers in that area. But we did not go in there with no expectations. We did not go in there with no hypotheses, we did not go in there with no uh, prior theories. So there wasn't any prior theory that was directly applicable to drawing in the blind, because we were one of the first ones to do drawing in the blind. But there were uh, theories that were applicable if we made some simplifications. So for example, there was a theory about the localization of function in the brain that said that this particular lobe right here, that is your visual cortex. And that's where it's localized. This particular lobe over here, that is your somatosensory cortex. And they are in two different sections. So two different locations in your brain. Um, what do they serve uh, in terms of functions? Well, your visual cortex, uh, sorry, we'll start off with somatosensory. Your somatosensory cortex processes touch. That's a very large simplification of what your somatosensory cortex does. And there are people that devote their entire research career to figuring out how does the somatosensory cortex work. But for our purposes, for comparing people drawing who are blind and are using touch versus people drawing who use vision, it's enough for us to know that the somatosensory cortex processes touch. It's also enough for us to know that the visual cortex processes vision. So this area of the cortex processes vision. It is super complicated, right? There are multiple layers, multiple different ways of representation, but it's enough for us to know that the visual cortex processes uh, vision. From that, we continue on with the train of thought and we go, all right, so if the somatosensory cortex processes, processes touch, then a touch task, a tactile task, is going to use that area of the cortex, right? And this has been shown before. You have people touch things, the somatosensory cortex lights up. Same thing with visual tasks and the visual cortex. If you use a visual task, the visual cortex will light up. That's how we know what is, uh, that's how we know that this is the actual area that does visual work. So again, 
massive oversimplifications, but still getting to the heart of what these prior theories is telling us. And then the last thing is that different parts of the cortex are going to uh, process things in different ways. So the wiring here is way different than the wiring here, right? So different areas, localization in different areas means that those areas are going to be processed or those uh, stimuli are going to be processed differently. And that's that idea of localization of function. Again, massive simplification, but again, true. We're not making up anything. We're just making it easy to kind of connect the dots and get that chain of thought going. All right, so we have that. And then finally, we put it all together in a chain of thought and deduction to make our prediction. So visual tasks occur in your brain, in one area of your brain. They occur in the visual uh, cortex. Tactile tasks occur in another area. They occur in the somatosensory cortex. Different areas process information differently, right? So we have visual in one area, tactile in another area, different areas process things differently. Therefore, we can predict what's going to happen. We can predict that a tactile task should be solved differently than a visual task according to this deductive chain. So then we make our new application. So tasks using visual input should be solved differently than a task using a tactile input. And then we're, made, we're able to make our final deduction that drawing by a sighted person should look different than drawings by a blind person. So that entire chain occurred because of those simplifications, because of that linking, if this is true, and this is true, and this is true, then this has to be true. Tasks uh, using visual input should be solved differently than tasks using tactile input. And if this is true, then this has to be true, that drawings by a sighted person should look different than drawings by a blind person. And that is our prediction. That is our hypothesis. So built upon what was done before, Right? And nobody who did this work was doing things on drawing in the blind. But built upon what was done before, we came up with this uh, hypothesis about what should happen in our particular experimental situation. All right, any questions so far? Okay. So why do we come up with a hypothesis? Because once you come up with a hypothesis, then you know what it is that you need in order to design your test. So once you come up with that prediction, right, that it, this is what should occur in this situation. Drawings by the sighted should look different than drawings by the blind. People suffering from depression should process this differently than people who don't. Um, you know, whatever it is, you come up with that hypothesis, that's what directs you towards your experimental design. So once you have that hypothesis, once we knew that drawings by a sighted person should look different than drawings by a blind person, well, then we took not Ashraf, but another subject, and we said, all right, draw us a picture of a house. So we gave them a model of a house. There's the front view. It was a little wooden model of a house. There's the front view. There's the side view. There's the uh, view from the top. And uh, we gave it to them, and we held it out in front of them, and we put it down a little bit. And we said, draw this, you know, feel it and draw it as if you're drawing, you know, from this um, orientation. You would be surprised when you start working with uh, blind people, how much of our language is laden with visual analogies. So I was about to say, draw it from this point of view. That makes no sense because they don't have a viewpoint, but draw it from this orientation. So that's what we would do. It's a little aside. Anyways. Um, we asked them to draw this and notice that if a sighted person was drawing it from that orientation, certain things are visible, certain things are not visible, right? So the front roof visible, front door visible, back wall, not visible, back roof, not visible. That's how th that's the situation for a sighted person. But notice that when we gave them that house, that's not the situation for a blind individual, right? A blind individual can feel the front. A blind individual can feel the back. They can feel all around, right? So when they have it in this orientation, 
They can feel the entire model of the house. So what are they going to do? Well, that's why we ran the experiment. So they should draw something differently. They should draw a different picture than what a sighted person would draw. A sighted person, if they're a pretty good artist, would draw this perspective picture of that house. So you would have the front door visible, the front wall visible. You would have the converging lines for the roof. That would be visible there as well. We did this study. Uh, it was a case study. It was on one person uh, that we ran. Uh, her name was M. And this is what our blind subject drew. So side by side, you can see that they're basically the exact same picture. So this was surprising because our hypothesis did not predict this. Uh, and this is why you need a hypothesis in the first place because, and we do the research because you're not always going to find what you think you're going to find. All right. So once again, we had this hypothesis. Turns out we didn't find what we thought we were going to find. So what does this mean? Well, if your predictions are supported by the results, so if the thing that you predicted should occur based on the theories, if that's supported by what you actually find, uh, certain things happen. If it's not supported, other things happen. So what happens if they are supported? That means that the theories that you based your hypothesis on are more likely to be true. So when you have your prior theories and you make a prediction and you set up an experiment or a, uh, a corpus analysis to test that, if you find your prediction, that means that the theories that you used to make that prediction are more likely to be true. You've increased the probability that those theories are correct. If, on the other hand, like us, your predictions are not supported by the results, that means that the theories that you base them on reduce their likelihood of being true. Uh, they reduce the uh, likelihood that they're going to be supported. So this is what science basically does. And if theories get enough of these occurring, we discard them. If theories get enough of these occurring, they become more and more accepted in the community. And that's part of the way that research uh, develops psychology by weeding out the bad theories uh, from the good theories. All right. Any questions about that? So far, so good. All right. OK, so one more thing we'll talk about today is uh, modeling research and uh, modeling research. Part of it is using other people's um, techniques and measures and things like that. Uh, but really what it's about is you're taking your concepts into the physical world. So you're somehow translating abstract ideas or abstract concepts and you're moving those into the physical world uh, somehow. So depression is an abstract thing, right? But if you want to do a study on it, you have to move depression somehow into the physical world. Learning is an abstract thing. But if you want to measure, if you have to want to study it, you need to move it somehow into the physical world. So this is what we mean by taking concepts into the physical world, changing these abstract ideas into something that you can measure, something that you can actually get a handle on. And that is where we need to start thinking about our operational definitions. So an operational definition, this is a definition of a concept in terms of the procedures that are used to measure them. So it's not necessarily what the concept means. It's not necessarily what the concept is. It's how do you actually measure these specific concepts? How do you bring them from abstract into the physical world? So let's take a look at uh, uh, a few, well, I'll, I'll give you a, a sort of the clear psychology example for this. Depression, right? Abstract concept. You can't see depression. You can't hold depression, right? It's something that goes on in our mind. But we need to move it into the physical world if we're going to study it. And that's where operational definitions of depression come in, like Beck's depression inventory. So Beck's depression inventory is just a series of questions. It is not depression, but it measures depression. It's the way to take that concept from being abstract into something that we can actually measure and uh, um, and use. 
So that's another thing that you need to start thinking about. So whatever sort of concepts that you have, you need to start thinking about how are you going to make those physical, real in the real world. So for example, if you were, um, uh, if, if your uh, one, if your experiment requires that half of your subjects get an easy task and half of your subjects get a harder task, right? Let's say that that's part of your experimental design. You need to start getting very clear on an operational definition of what do you mean by harder task. So a harder task could be a task where you get less time to complete. So if I give my students an exam. It's going to be a lot harder if I tell them they have 10 minutes to finish the exam versus an hour and 15 minutes. So is that what you mean by a harder task? Does it mean that you're going to show them blurred stimuli? So if you're doing a visual task, if you blur the stimuli on a visual task, it gets a lot harder to do identification. Is that what you mean by harder? Do you mean that there's going to be music playing? Maybe there's a distraction during the task. Is that what you mean uh, by harder? So we need to start pinpointing these and making decisions so that we can bring our ideas into the physical world. Uh, another example, better memory. So if you're doing a memory study and your prediction is that people in this condition should have better memory than people in this other condition. And it might be as general as that because again, we simplified the theories. That means we're probably gonna have a simplified um, uh, a simplified uh, prediction as well. So we might have a prediction that says group A should have better memory than group B. What do we mean by better memory? How are we going to measure that? Do we mean that they're going to have a higher recall percentage? Is that what we're going to use in our experiment or our research? Does that mean that they're faster to recall? So does that mean that we're going to see how long it takes them to come up with the complete list? And somebody comes up with it in 30 seconds, whereas somebody else comes up with it in two minutes, 30 seconds has a better memory. Are we going to uh, use recognition instead of recall? Are we going to have higher recognition percentage? Or are we going to use false alarms? Are we going to use uh, fewer recognition errors? All of these are ways of measuring better memory. And what we need to do now in our, uh, in our research is start to come up with our decisions on which one of these we're actually going to use to take these concepts into the physical world. All right. So definitions, we need our operational definitions. How are we going to measure? How are we going to implement these abstract concepts? And as I mentioned in our meetings before, but I want to uh, remind you again, you are encouraged to use other researchers' operational definitions. So if in your prior research, if in your background theories, another researcher used a technique to operationalize a concept that you need, you are highly uh, encouraged to use that particular technique, to use that operational definition. So I mentioned the Beck's depression inventory before. If I was doing a study on depression, it would be ludicrous of me to think that I would do a good job measuring depression if I made up a depression scale on my own. If I came up with the Dr. Yudichvich scale of depression, um, it would probably in all honesty suck and lead to a poor research project. But if I use something that's established that other researchers have basically put their stamp of approval on, like Beck's depression inventory, that's gonna increase the quality of my research. The other thing that the other reason why you're encouraged to use other researchers' operational definitions is that when you find out what your results are, it's way easier to compare them to other researchers that have already used that particular measure. So if I find a result using Beck's depression inventory, and let's say that uh, my result is very counterintuitive. My result is that people with depression actually have a higher rate uh, positive thinking than people without depression. Let's say that that's where my experiment, those are the results of my experiment. If I use the Beck's depression inventory, I can then compare my results to every single other experiment that has ever used the Beck's depression inventory, and we can compare and contrast and see where this weird result came from. 
If I instead use the Dr. Yudichevich, you know, uh, survey of depression, then it could either be depression that's causing this uh, counterintuitive result, or it could be the fact that my inventory isn't the same as the inventory other people's use. In either condition, I can't compare my results to anybody's that came before. So you are vastly encouraged to use other people's operational definitions, other people's ways of bringing in those abstract comment, uh, concepts into that physical world. All right, any questions on the modeling of the research? All right, so we got prior theories that we're going to use to make uh, predictions in novel settings. Those novel settings will then be your experiments. So again, you're starting with your prior theories. You're making your predictions. And then those predictions are what's going to guide your uh, experimental question, your experimental design. And then once you kind of have a handle on what your experimental design is, you want to start considering your operational definitions. How are you going to measure those concepts? Some of them are straightforward. Some of them are a little bit harder to get a handle on. Some of them will have established uh, mechanisms and, and uh, uh, operations. Some of them might not. Um, you know, that's the, the weird and wonderful thing about research. But it's time to start thinking about how are we going to uh, do those uh, operational definitions. So what we're going to do now for the remainder of uh, today's class is we are going to uh, get into groups and uh, you will, uh, as a group, try to uh, come up with um, your novel, your predictions, make a prediction for a novel setting, or if you already have that, try to start discussing and thinking about operational definitions. So this will be your chance to sort of get immediate feedback from your peers, get a little bit of um, you know, uh, collaboration going, kind of bounce some ideas off, try things out, uh, because others of you might have suggestions and fresh perspectives that'll really help you kind of suss out some of what you're uh, doing. Um, on the other, uh, another thing to consider, some of you are gonna be further along than others, right? It's early in the semester, uh, depending upon how much uh, background work you've done already, you might be further along. So this will also be a nice opportunity if you need to catch up to kind of get a little bit of feedback and get a little bit of input on exactly uh, what you know is required in order to do these things. So if you have, if you're set on this and you're set on this, try to give a little bit of uh, help to somebody else in your group uh, to move them along so that they can get their project going as well. Is you can do this one person at a time, kind of help each other out. And you can do either of these or both of them. Discuss your prior theories. Try to come up with a new prediction, a new thing that should occur. And then also start thinking about operational definitions that you can do to measure the concepts that you need. So you can do this before you do this. You can do this before you do this. They're going to have some overlap with each other. And again, some of you might be further along. Some of you uh, might be a little bit further behind. That's fine as well. Let's all just uh, collaborate, try to help each other out, and uh, see if we can start getting some concrete ideas down, some predictions down, some operational definitions down. Oh, and call me over if you need assistance. All right, so uh, I like the discussion. This is awesome, but uh, I do want to wrap up uh, today's class just so we know what's going to happen uh, next week. All right, so this was your first step towards kind of finalizing, you know, thinking about some of the uh, decisions that you need to make in order to do your uh, research project. So uh, just to make sure that everybody is up to date on what it is that uh, we're going to be doing next week, the next kind of steps that we take. So uh, your plagiarism certificate test, your ProProps APA test, those are due by Monday at 11.59. Um, I will let you know that there is a glitch on one of these ProProp APA tests where the maximum you can get is 71%. So you can do these as many times as you like in order to get 100%. They're meant to just kind of like refresh your memory in terms of APA uh, style. But if you try one and, you, you know, if you get 100 on all of them and you get 71% on one of them, that one, I just can't remember offhand which one it is. One of them, you can only get 75%. So just bear that in mind. And then uh, we will be going over a little bit more about writing introduction to research methodology. 
so that we can get that topic paragraph and research hypothesis assignment done. So this is really going to be like a short little, this is my topic, here's my prediction. But you will have to uh, include your prior theories, you know, based on this idea, based on this person's theory, based on, you know, this research that came before. And it's basically going to be based on these prior theories. If I set up this situation, this is what I predict should happen. And again, that's kind of your first step towards uh, dealing with your uh, research methodology. And that's why for next uh, week, we will be uh, starting to take a look at questions about research methodologies. For those of you doing experiments, what kind of experiment do you want to run? Is it going to be within subject, between subjects? How many conditions? You know, uh, what sort of um, presentations, you know, are you going to use? For those of you doing corpus analyses, how do you choose your uh, data? How do you access your data? Uh, we'll be doing that as well. And uh, all of this is uh, building towards one of our first um, major hurdles, which is the IRB protocol. So you're going to notice that that's the end. That's going to be due at the end of January. The IRB protocols, we're going to submit them by the end of January. I want to get uh, this in as soon as we can, just in case we have to make adjustments to people's uh, methodologies, we'll have the time for you to do that and still get you know access to enough subjects. I will let you know that for your IRB protocol, every aspect of your experimental design has to be done. So your experiment literally has to be submitted to the IRB where you say, this is it, this is what I'm doing, it is 100% designed and complete. So we're going to be building up to that, right? You might have little bits and pieces here, but start collecting those ideas. Again, those operational definitions, those different categories, the ways of inducing those different categories, because by the uh, 30th at midnight, when we submit those, um, we're going to need to have all of those answered. How many questions are you asking? How many pictures are you using? Which pictures are you using? How do you decide who goes into the different conditions? Uh, does everybody do the all conditions or do they split? Everything needs to be uh, finalized by that time. So we'll talk a lot about research methodology. You can see we've got a week and a half because we have to start making those decisions. But um, do start writing down your decisions and planning it out. You know, this is my prediction. This is how I'm measuring this. This is how I'm inducing this. This is what I mean by a harder task. And then uh, that will uh, basically uh, be your first step towards getting on your way. But don't forget plagiarism certificate test and your pro profs test. And uh, any questions before we wrap up for the day? No? All right. So that is it. So continue your work. Continue your progress. Uh, start making those decisions. Write them down. Make a plan. And uh, I will see you all next week.